everybody. So, uh, although the, no, I'm not say that I'm not Italian again. Well, I just said, <laughs> because the, the pronunciation of my name was, was sound very Italian, uh, but I'm not. Uh, so, uh, as uh, it was said, I, I'm a maintainer of play and Lagon framework, but I will not talk about that today. I'll talk about arc persistence type. Uh, I like very much the topic. I've been doing secure as event sourcing for quite some time, even before I joined Lightband. Lagon is all everything about event sourcing. And Aka Persistence Typed is here and uh, just got released together with Aka Typed. And for me, it's very exciting. I really enjoy that API. And uh, I hope you guys are going to like it as well. So, uh, but before a little a brief story about uh, history about uh, Aka Persistence. So, it, it started as an extension made by Martin Krasser. And it was called event sourced uh, extension. And that was to do, just to do event sourcing of an actor. So you have a state of an actor. And so an actor, just an actor does not persist a state. So you have data in memory. When you remove the actor, the data goes. So what Martin Krass did was to create a, an extension that would use a plugin. I think the first implementation was a Cassandra plugin, which is still out there. Is the, the uh, now even supported by, developed by Lightband. So that plugin, what, what does event sourcing in Aka? It's whenever you have a message, you can emit events that will be persisted in a journal. And then when you reinstantiate that actor back, we're going to replay that event and recreate the, the state of that actor. That's just the, the basics of uh, event source. And that's what the, this extension was doing. In Aka 2.4, that extension became part of Aka. It was integrated in the Aka code base and became Aka persistence. And uh, <laughs> but when you are persisting events uh, for to create to persist the events for an actor, you can only use that of those events for that actor. There was one piece missing. Uh, at the time, there was something called the persistence view. But was not exactly what we needed. That was at some point deprecated and replaced by Aka persistence query. So on one side you have, in a command a query uh, segregation uh, uh, responsibility segregation uh, pattern of CQRS, you have on one side you are writing data and that's the actor event source, and on the other side you need to read the events and generate whatever you want from that. And that, that part was missing, and uh, it was introduced in, uh, in ACA 2.5 as ACA persistence query. So I can persist my events in one side, and on the other side I can query and say, give me all the events for that ID, or give me all, all the events of that type, and I get a stream of events that I can uh, consume and produce data from that. And, and now, uh, well, I need to fix it. OK, I fixed my slide, and I forgot this line. It's not upcoming. It's there. We released ACA 2.6 two, two, three weeks ago. So it's there. Uh, and then with ACA typed, in ACA 2.6, we also have a new API for ACA persistence typed. So uh, who have used ACA persistence untyped? One, two, three, four, five. Like uh, was on my that talk a previous time, uh, so I confirm he have used we work together. I know he used it. Well, if you have used it before, there are many ways to to to. It was a very open API. Let's put it like that. Very open in the sense that you just could choose what to do, and you could also choose to do it wrong. And uh, Aka persistence type remove that. Now it's a very strict API that allows you to, to write your business code, but does all the hard lifting for you. So ev every, everything that uh, you could eventually do wrong with the untyped version in ACA typed, ACA persist typed, is, uh, you just get it correct. There is no way of building a, a to encode it in a wrong way. So for me, it's, that's a huge advantage. Yeah, so ACA 2.6 is here. So I've been giving this talk a few times, and each time I was updating the version of ACA because we were over uh, release candidate one and so on, but 2.6 is here now. So the code that is here is the code that you get to, uh, if you download now and start to play around. There is nothing that will change. The API is stable. 
So, but before, a little bit of ACA typed. So in ACA, as you know, before, there was no types. It was a function from any to units running somewhere uh, in, your, in your JVM, maybe even in another node. And that's a hard thing to, to manage. And of course, we were uh, willing to solve that problem for a long time, and we are very happy that we have solved that. We have now ACA typed. And what do you do with ACA type? The first thing to do is to define the protocol of your message. So you cannot just, when I define an actor, have to define what are the message that I can send to that actor. So in that ex simple example here, I have one common trait. I have lack of creativity. I just call it message. And it will have a say hello and a change greeting. And uh, in ACA typed, uh, actually, there is even not, you don't extend an actor anymore, but you define a function, and that function is a behavior function. You just define a function that is from some message to some other behavior. Because that's all about actors is that. It should receive a message, handle a message, and tell what is the next behavior. You know? So uh, in that example here, I'm defined just a receive message, a receive a function, in which I have the say hello, I do some side effect, in that case I'm print ln. I have a better example of that later without <laughs> side effects. And then I'm just returning that same behavior. And when I change the greeting, I'm getting a new greeting, and I'm, I, as you can see, let me see if I, yeah. Uh, I'm just calling behavior here, which is actually building, calling that same method and building a new behavior and I'm changing the greeting. So next time that I receive a say hello, the greeting will be changed to something else. So if I say hola instead of hello, next message, it will print say, uh, it, will it will print hello, or hola, some name. No? So basically that's the, the, the thing about ACA typed, the change in the API. Now, one thing that exists in, in ACA the classic one, the untyped one, is that for every message, you had a sender. You had a sender, and you could answer back. Or you can send a message to the sender, and if, you, if you're calling an actor from outside the actor system, uh, that sender, you do an ask, and what you get from, from when you send an ask is you get a future that will be completed when you send a message to the sender. But that's gone. So we don't do that anymore in ACA typed. And what we do, we have to encode in our message the fact that we want a response. The fact that we are, we have to, to have a protocol for the response as well. And it happens in, by, the, by passing in my message here, the say hello message, I'm passing an actor ref of hello. Hello is now my answer. This actor ref here, will, someone will have to create an actor ref of hello for me, okay? When I get, I'm too close, let, let's go here. When I get, actually I don't need to be there, only when I code, I do some coding and then I move there. I give the talk from here. Here's better. So now I get the say hello and I have this reply. And then instead of print LN, I'm sending back a hello to that, to that actor here, okay? And you don't have the sender anymore. So you have to pass an actor ref that will handle the answer for you. So, but how I use it is if I'm outside, if I'm in an actor system, that say hello will be maybe, if I'm an actor and I'm talking to another actor, that say hello will be probably uh, myself that I will be passing to get the answer uh, to myself. But if you are outside, when you do the ask pattern, it's what you do when you are outside the actor system. When you are inside, when you are talking actors to actor, actors, you sh should not do ask, okay? You should just do normal passing message, no? But when you are outside, you want to get, uh, you want to get a future, you want to send a message, and you got, want to get a reply. What the uh, uh, actor will do for you, it will create a reply to, that's the actor that will get the message, and that you can use to send, to build that message here. And this reply to goes to that, uh, to that function, will the, your implementation will answer back, and when that message gets into the actor that will treat that message, it will complete the future. And that's how the actor uh, will reply to you, basically. 
And that's all about ACA typed. I will now go into ACA persistence and uh, typed. But before I want to highlight the, the main uh, points that we have to cover here. So in ACA typed, we have that idea now that you need to define the protocol, the protocol of your message. But in ACA persistence, your protocol is a little bit more extended. It's not only about the message that you send, but also the message that you're going to put on the journal and the state of that you're preserving. So there are three things to, 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 to define. Actually, there are a fourth one are the replies. You also need to define what are the replies. So your protocol are composed by messages, commands with the replies, the events, and the state itself. Uh, instead of building a behavior, you're going to build uh, event-sourced behavior. I'll co come back here because then I can read without turning my f back to you guys. Uh, there is also the concept of a tagging, which existed already in, in uh, the ARC untyped, ARC persistence untyped. And why I need the tagging is because I need to tag, not necessarily, but I would, I most probably want to tag my events so I can consume from the query side. That I can say, give me all the events tagged with the tag account, for instance, and then I can get all the events and consume them. Uh, the, the difference now with ACA typed is that you get a, a more intuitive API to define your tagging, as we're going to see. We also have a better control for snapshotting. So if you're not familiar with event sourcing, the idea of snapshotting, yeah, if I have a journal for one given entity that has like 10 messages, 10 events in the journal, that's nothing. Whenever I need to have it, I just bring it to memory, I replay. That's peanuts. But sometimes I can have over 1,000 messages, even more than that. I don't want to replay from scratch. So you, from time to time, you can save a snapshot. And when you reinstantiate, the first thing that you do, that the ACK will do, will bring the state that is saved on the snapshot into memory and replay the events that happened after that snapshot. So it will not replay from scratch, but from the snapshot. One error that people could do in the previous API is that some people, and I have seen, I have seen that happen, save the snapshot and then save the events. And that's wrong because you should first apply the events and then save the snapshot. And it was possible to do that. But in the typed version, the new API, you cannot do that. You cannot do that because you basically, you don't save the snapshot, you, you tell when you want to have a snapshot. And I can take care of that to apply, uh, to do the, the, the action at the right moment. Then we have something that we call uh, enforcement replies, and I will show you uh, in a demo, live coding. Uh, I think it's a better, it will become clear if I show code and show things compiling using inf enforced replies. So I will go over that in a while. Now, important is that the existing plugins, the existing journal, if you have ARCA uh, persistence in production, that's all compatible. Nothing changed. You don't have to change your plugin. It's just the higher level API for the user that change. The underneath are the same. Uh, the plugins, the plugins architecture didn't change. And uh, the ARCA persistence query didn't, uh, is untouched. It's exactly the same as before because it was already typed. It's based on uh, ACA streams, and ACA streams is typed, so there is no, no change there. So now we have types on both sides. So let's see how we're going to define the, our behavior. So I have here a, a count command. I took a very simple uh, uh, use case, a bank account, I have a very simplified bank account. You put money, you get money out, and you can get, ask for the balance. And uh, so I have an account command. I have deposit withdraw get balance that returns a balance. You see that is an actor f of balance, so I can do a ask and get it back. And I have account events with deposit and uh, withdrawn. And an account, of course, is my state. Uh, now, when you, when you, the next thing that you have to define is a command handler. And the command handler is a function, actually, from state and command, so your existing state, your new or the command that is coming in, and you have to return an effect. An effect is, uh, is actually a description of what needs to be done. It will not be executed. When you do that, this, you're just telling ACA, persistence typed, what you want to happen. 
In that case here, is the most simplified uh, option here. You put a deposit, and I would just say, persist that event that the deposit happened. As you can see, I'm not doing any validation because you can always put money in my account. I always accept a deposit, you know? so I have nothing to, to complain. You send money, I accept it. And I'm describing that. So what's going to happen here is that that effect, so you return that, so ACA, the, the library will take the effect to say, uh, now it's time for me to, pers to, to execute that. And it will execute by persisting that event. You can also declare things that you want to happen after persisting. But before persisting, what ACK will do is, let's go first to the event handler. And then I uh, explain that. The event handler is a function from state and event to the next state. So I get the apply event deposit for, for, for my account. And as you can see here, I'm modeling that more in an object-oriented way, in the sense like, if I need a, f a function from state event to state, I can have it modeled as a method in an account object, because I have accounts, and then I can lift that object representation to that function. Huh? So, uh, so back to the deposit. So the apply, I get a deposit in, and then I will update my state. I, and I return that new account. Okay? Uh, so back here. So what really happens here is that when uh, you tell Aka, I want to persist that event, the first thing that Aka will do, it will not persist, but it will apply the event. It will apply because that way I know that this event handler exists. Imagine that you forget to define a deposit here, to, to add that first line there. And in the previous one, if I, me, Aka typed, Aka persistence typed, if I persist the event, I persist, I put something in the journal, and now I'm going to apply it to your state, but you forgot to put the deposit uh, event handler, and it blows. It blows because you forgot to put it, but now you have the event in your journal, and you reinstantiate that, that uh, actor, it will try to replay, and again it will blow again. So this is not possible anymore, because when you do that, the first thing that Aka will gonna do is first verify you have that event handler, and if you have, you're gonna persist. If you don't, it blows up. Uh, uh, it end of game. So you're 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 encoding it incorrectly, so you cannot continue the game. No, you're trying to emit something that you cannot apply later. So those are the two, like to say the 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 meat of your uh, event sourced actor, the command handler where you do validations and the event handler. Then you have to take those functions and you have to glue them together to build a behavior. So here I'm taking an event source behavior for a command, an event, and account. I need to define a persistence ID. And the persistence ID, uh, the ID is something, let me go here. The ID is something that I will get from the user and I will define this persistence ID here and this account it's like a kind of namespace because I can have different persistence entities running and uh, the ID is just a string so I can now that was not in the previous one but you can have this kind of namespace in the journal uh, my initial state is a balance uh, is, a, is a balance of zero and then my two functions and you see here the function that I expect, in the, the first one is state command to effect, uh, but I encode it as object oriented in a, in a, as a method in the account, but now I can lift that method to that function. It's a matter of taste. You can just define functions directly if you want. You don't need to put it as a method in, the, in your object. It's just a matter of style and taste. Uh, it's up to you. But at the end, you need to lift to that function representation. So a function from state command to effect, and another one, state event to state. So the two main command handlers and event handlers. That's everything's actually about those two. Uh, no, I went back here. So, and then once you define your event behavior, event source behavior, you can fine tune it. And you can say, and I want a tagger. And the tagger here is from event, is a function from event to a set of strings. And th that is, here I'm defining what are the tags that I want to put for each single event that I put in the journal. Or I can define 
what are the snapshot strategies that I want. And there are two ways, and they, you can use both. One is by counting. I want a snapshot every 100 events or uh, when a predicate happens, uh, uh, holds. I have a function from the current state, the event that just got in, the sequence number in the journal, and then you make a decision if you want to save a snapshot at that moment, yes or no. You can bo use both strategies, and uh, you'll be uh, saving a snapshot every 100 events, but also when that uh, condition holds, for instance. Okay, <laughs> live coding. Uh, who was asking if I was nervous? Now I am, <laughs> because I, I'm not so good in that. Okay, oh, that's not the project. Uh, bum -bum. So here I have a more complex example. So this the account, uh, account example is a little bit more extended. So I have here, so here's exactly what we have in the, in the slides. I glue them together. Is that big enough? Yes. Eh? So I glue them together. Here I have the event handler as before. But I have here uh, a, com a command handler that's a little bit more sophisticated, let's say, more involved. So each event here, like if you see here the deposit and withdraw, each of them have a reply to. And uh, ah, that's also an important thing. In general, uh, in account typed, you could send a, f a, a, a failure back. If I do a ask, I could failure, fail that future by sending a, a, a failure back that would make that future fail. I cannot do that anymore. Because, uh, because when I send a, a, a response, I'm, I have to send a message to an actor, a type at actor. I cannot send a failure because when you define that, that actor, you have to define the protocol, the message that that actor can accept. And the ACA failure type is not one of them. So you cannot have it. So when you want to sign that some message failed, you have to encode it. So as you see here, I have, uh, where I define it, I have uh, a few types of reply. I have this account reply, it's a common trait. I can reply with a balance or with a confirmation. And the confirmation can be an accepted, I accepted the command, or I reject it. So now when you get that future, if you reject the deposit, of the deposit you never reject, if you reject the withdrawal, you get actually a future that is successful, but whose type is a rejected? Well, it will be a confirmation, but then uh, of the, you have to put a match and see if it was accepted or reject. So even the failures have to be uh, uh, encoded, and that's, again, uh, a plus point. So I have this here, and uh, I have a deposit coming in, and I have a reply, and then I can say, Persist that thing, and when you finish with the persistence, when you when you are sure that this thing is on disk, I want to then run that. It's a kind of side effect way. Say okay, do that, and when finish, do that other thing, which will be in that case I will. What I have here that underscore is the updated state of my account, but I'm not using it here. So I just take the reply from the message, and I use that then run as a means to send back the response. The problem is that compiles. Now you are encoding a protocol that you want to have a response because you have a reply to to respond, but there is nothing in the, in, in that I, I, I have no means here to force the user, the developer, to, to reply. What will happen when I do that is that my future, the future that where I'm expecting to get my reply, will never complete because the actor is not replying. So how can we solve that? 
And we have a, that's what we call enforced replies. And because this event sourcing thing, it's very common that you have a model that models a consistency boundary, your aggregate, your domain. And uh, what happens is very often you talk with, to it from outside. You're outside the actor system talking to that model having them uh, validate commands and persistent events. So it's a very common pattern to, when you're doing secure as event sourcing, to do ask instead of tell no, in ACA. So it's very common to have replies. So because of that, we have this new functionality. So you go here to the event sourcing behavior, event source behavior, and you do with enforced replies. Now. That thing changed now, because before it was returning an uh, effect. But now, is this compiling? Yeah. You see here that it's not compiling, because it, it will say that, uh, pum, 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 that apply commands is return an effect, but it should return a reply effect. So now we are changing the type that I have to return to force people to, re to reply. So we need to change it. And what we do is, OK, uh, I, I set it as reply effect. But now it's here that it's not compiling. That line, and that line, and that line. So how can I do here? So I have to, so let's let put like that. Here, this line, this line is returning an effect, but I, I need now a reply effect. So I have to lift it to reply effect. And how we do that? We have then, then reply. Then reply that accept a reply to, and a function, it, which I will have the updated account. And then I can reply. What was accepted? Let me just put it like that. So I just want it to compile for now, and then I can continue. No, ah, I put it wrong. Yeah, that's, that's the case when, although you're using forced reply, for that message, you don't have a reply. And then you can say, OK, here, I know what I'm doing. I, I have no reply. So what we want is actually this one. Please compile. No. And that is, ah, yeah, no, is that one. I just have a function from my updated state to the type that I want to reply. I just need to provide that function. And uh, in that case here, I'm not using that, so it could be underscore. I just want to show that this is the updated state that you get in that function. And what it will do, it will take that reply that you are passing first, and it will take that, uh, that function, we we'll call that function, get you your return type, and send to the reply to. And now this thing is compiling as expected. So that's the idea of the enforced replies. OK, let me go to the safe uh, harbor of uh, slides and think to click. Only one button, much easier. So, so that's the idea of the enforced replies, to have an API that you choose to, to, to take that pattern, like I want to have replies. So most of the case, you're going to have a reply to, and the API will force, the compiler will force you to take that path, except in the case that you don't want. And then you don't put a reply to on your, on your message, and then you can just use that method, then no reply. I'm finished here. It's, it's good. OK. The second part of the presentation is about cluster sharding. And I think that's before. Uh, it was a known thing, but not maybe not well and uh, well known thing. Uh, we always recommend using ACA persistence with cluster sharding, and the reason for that well, there are many reasons. So the first, what happens is that if you have only one JVM, imagine that if you start an actor and it stays in memory, it will not be removed. So if you have a request for account identified by ID ABC. I'm good in time, it's OK. Uh, if you have ID ABC for account, 
you instantiate that actor identified by that. That will be in memory. Now you have you receive another deposit. Now, if you try to instantiate that actor, you get a failure because you can only have one actor identified on that path on the on one single JVM. So you need to have the means to know if this is there or not, if it's in memory or not. Of course, in general actor development. You just put things in memory and they stay there. But here it's different. We are talking about data, about persistence. So uh, we have many different requests coming and bringing things in memory and doing persistence. At some point, you have them all in memory and you need to shut down them. You need to keep track of who is in memory, yes or not. OK, so you could have a kind of manager on top of that. And you say, OK, I first go to the manager and the manager take care to instantiate it of remove it and so on. I have done that before. I have, uh, in a previous job, we were doing ACA persistence without clusters, so we create our own manager thing. That works until you decide to scale your application. And you go to Kubernetes, now today you just click things and you uh, spawn three different nodes. And what happens when you do that, if, if you are not doing cluster sharding, is that you, ha you have now three nodes, let's say. That means three JVMs running. Those managers, the way that I was solving that before, building my own manager, they don't know about each other. So you have three JVMs. If you put something to manage your, your to know who is already in memory or not, you have three things in memory that they no, don't communicate with each other. And then if you, you, you are, there is a request, a, a deposit coming on first node, you bring that actor in memory, you put events. There is a second request coming on the second node. That same actor, the same entity will be brought into memory. And now you have two of those in memory in two different JVMs. And you have a state that is not being correctly managed because they are right on the same journal. So now you have a problem. So how can we deal with persistence in a cluster environment? The class classical solution is to don't have things in memory. You go each time to the database and use the database as the state storage for everything. And when you do that, you need to do optimistic locking because you can have two requests coming in. This one is updated. This one has to fail because the, the, uh, when it sees the data, is the previous data, it ha it's manipulates stale a lot. That's all fine. That works, but that doesn't scale. So the whole idea here is to you bring that into memory and there is only, and you have to guarantee that, that there is only one in memory, even if you have many clusters, uh, many nodes. That's why it's necessary to have uh, ACA cluster. Otherwise, this won't work the way you expect. O of course, you can go for optimistic locking, not with ACA persistence. That we choose to 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 not do that. Why? Because when you have, when you remove optimistic locking. And when you have the means to guarantee that uh, there is only one of them in memory, then you can do append-only journal. And append-only journal will perform much, much better than a database that you are constantly checking if you can save that or not. So you're just appending on the journal. So you, you increase your throughput uh, uh, for your events. So that's the, 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 the reason why we, ch we chose that path. You know? If you don't have this uh, uh, performance requirement, you may choose other technique, but that's what ACA Persistence is offering. You know? a, uh, single writer principle, only one in the JVM, append only journal for higher throughput. So that's uh, important. Uh, so I was talking about the manager, so I actually forgot to go through the, uh, I'll just do like that. Uh, no, one too much. Yeah, so management. Cluster shard take the manager for you. You don't have to build your manager yourself. Uh, it knows where is the instance. So if you send a message to account ABC and it arrives to that node, the node will know, oh, it's not for me. It's for that other node there. So I have to send the forward that to that other node because account ABC is running on that other node. The cluster shard takes care of that. It knows where ABC, account ABC must be. So it will forward. It has a consequence of that. Is the last line here. W when you send a command to an entity, it has to be serializable, so it can travel eventually to another no another node. The cluster shard takes care of that. 
because Aga is now taking care of managing the data to manage what is in memory and where it is in memory, so it, it also has to take care of removing things from, from memory, because otherwise you keep filling your memory with data, with uh, entities, and at some point you go out of memory. So there is this concept of uh, passivation, in which you, uh, it's uh, two minutes, I think. If, if something that is in memory, an entity is in memory, and doesn't receive any command for two minutes, Aka will decide to passivate it, to remove it from memory. So if in that meantime there is a new command coming, on, coming in, the Aka will bring that back into memory, replay the events and uh, handle the command. And of course the third point is that it honors the single writer uh, principle even when you are over JVM. Now even if you don't, if you're not uh, deploying more than one node, there is one more reason to use cluster sharding, is that it allows you rolling up updates. First error that people say do when say, ah, I don't need cluster sharding because I only have one node and I will never increase it. I'm fine. And then tomorrow they deploy a new version and what Kubernetes does, for instance, when you update, it brings one and remove the other. And for some period of time, you have two of them in memory but they are not forming a cluster, it means that you can potentially uh, corrupt the data. So rolling updates uh, are possible when you have cluster sharding, because what will happen is, even if you have one node, you bring it, you have lots of things in memory here, you bring another node, they form a cluster, some of those entities will be transferred to the other nodes. When you shut down, the cluster shard knows that those entities are gone and they will instantiate it here. So it swap the nodes. So that's an important feature. Feature. So how you do that? Cluster sharding. So as I was saying, when you do cluster sharding, Aka is taking care of, of that for you. So before I had this behavior method that was receiving an, an ID, but now it's different because I'll not be calling that. It's Aka that will call that. Uh, Aka will need a little bit more information. So the first thing that I will decide he define here is a type key. A type key for account command is the type of that I can send, my message that I can send, and some identifier. Then I will use, uh, instead of having a behavior that receives an ID, I will have a behavior that receives an entity context. And I can use that entity context now to build my persistence ID. As you can see here, pum -pum, let me... Uh, here, I'm using the entity context to take the name, which comes from here, and uh, some entity ID that will be defined by the user. And it will come in the context. Now I can build, Aka will be able to use that function based on an entity context. So the user, you as user, will not be calling behavior, but Aka, because now Aka is managing uh, that entity. Once you have that, you need to, give, to tell Aka about it. And you're going to say, OK, there is that entity. We call it an entity when you shard it. There is this type key that I defined before, no? the type key, uh, the first line inside the account <laughs> companion object. And here's the function to build instance of that. It's a function from that entity context to some behavior. When you do that, the, the matter is init. It's initializing the shard, but it's not instantiate any of the instance. Aka doesn't know what are the IDs that it needs to instantiate. It's you later that will instantiate things. But it's preparing the shard. It is initializing the shard. When you do that, the cluster shard now knows that this thing exists and will create the shard regions for that. And then when you want to use you take the cluster shard and say, okay, now I want a real instance of that. Or better said, a reference, because in Aka, you never get into the thing, you always have a reference to it. And uh, so what you have to do, first I need, because it's typed, I need to have something to tell me the type, and that is the type key. The type key that I define it here is saying that it's a count command. That's the type that I can send. So I define, I, I, now I ask to have an instance of that, for that account number, that by the way is my account number. And as said, I always accept money, okay? So that's the second hint of the talk. I'm joking, it's not my account number, but you can always send money. So uh, type key, entity ID. 
And now what I got, I got an entity ref, which is like an actor ref, but the only thing is that it's typed different. So you know that this thing can be in the node where you are, but can be also in another node. And ACA is taking care of distributing that over the nodes. No? Takeaways. It's a much better API because it's declarative. I mean, ACA untyped was uh, imperative. You have to do it yourself, and you could swap things, get things in the wrong way. Now, you just declare what you want to have what you want to happen, what you want to persist, wh how you want to answer, uh, to respond back, uh, when you want to save snapshots, and so on. And I could do all the rest for you. And again, that's th for me the most important, because you just concentrate on command handlers and event handlers in your modeling. You look at the code. Of course, there is some types that are uh, 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 from ACA, like effect. But your code is super clear. It's uh, like, that happens. I validate my command. I decide if I will reject it, yes or not. I will persist events, yes or not. Uh, types. Types everywhere. We, finally we are finally here with ACA typed. Not only the persistence API, but the whole ACA uh, uh, APIs. Now we have the untyped. It's still there. It's not deprecated. We cannot deprecate like that, and it will stay for long. But so if you start the ACA today, just go for ACA type. Don't think twice. ACA type is uh, functions. So before it was more object oriented. N nothing against. But uh, if you think about uh, what we are really doing, uh, we don't need to extend an actor anymore. We just need to define the function. And that function will run somewhere, and I send a message that will go through that function and do uh, apply my business logic. Being that ACA typed or ACA persistence typed, doesn't matter. It's about uh, defining functions that will be running somewhere in my application. It's over. Any two units asynchronous. It's still asynchronous, and that's the why we are doing ACA. If you don't want asynchronous, if you don't need, you should not use it. But it's gone. It's part of the past. You don't need to. So the, the next one that complain about a, a function and two, two units in front of me gets a hug. Because I know that you are upset, and we can be uh, happy now. But for me, the also very important is the possibilities of event source, and what does that mean, actually, for building microservice? No? So, we, so we, we have this thing that we talk a lot in the white band, that people go to microservice, they go from monolith applications to microservice, but then at the end they create what we call a microleaf, because they split everything, but they are still calling each other uh, directly, meaning that if this uh, service goes down, that order is not functioning anymore. And how you remove, so you're only adding latency and complexity when we do that. That's not what you do want when you go microservice. What you do is, why you do that? Because you want to split functionality so we can scale that differently. I can remove that application and the other is still running. I can refactor that application without affecting the others. That's why we go for microservice and many other reasons. And the, the, the coupling of service happens when you have event sourcing. Because without that, you are dependent on data. You will always be dependent on data between, depend, so have the service depending on each other. But if you depend on calling each other, you will create coupling. But if you have event source applications, now I can have my events. I can represent the chains of my uh, system in terms of events that I can consume, put in Kafka, one example, you can put in other uh, kind of brokers as well. So the other service can consume that Kafka topic. And it's not depend on me anymore, but depending on an infrastructure uh, broker that where uh, it will listen to the event. So I may decide to refactor or uh, redeploy that application, while the other one is not depending on me. It's depending on a Kafka topic. So that's w where it becomes interesting. I'm running out of time, but I think that's the before last line, high throughput because append only journals. If you don't have that, if you're doing optimistic lock, it's another kind of application. It's not the same. And of course, scalability with the cluster. Not only that, that you can, if you need more, you just deploy more cluster and you spread your actors over the cluster, but also 
yeah, you, you're deploying Kubernetes, one gets down, it's, it comes back, Kubernetes will take care of that for you and so on. And the rolling up grades, it's very important uh, for, for, <laughs> in, uh, for production applications. Of course, before John Lightband, I was working on the Flemish government. We are not using cluster because, you know, at 4 o'clock we could shut, out, shut, shut down all the machines because the government, everybody had stopped work at 4. So we, ha we could update our application from 4 to 9. I mean, exaggerate, exaggerate a little bit, but we, we could shut down everything and redeploy during the night. But that's a luxury position. Today, that's not what uh, people, uh, the, the situation that most people are, are dealing with. Hmm? Oh, one more. Well, there is one thing that is in Lagon and that uh, we'll be working on that, I hope, soon, is how can I consume the events in a distributed way? That exists in Lagon, but not... At some point, we need to offer that also in Aka and in Play, and it's something that is coming. So thanks for listening. That's, uh, the code is on, on this uh, GitHub, and you can reach out to me. I think I don't have time for questions, but yeah, I, I have, because I, I start five minutes later, so we can have some questions. If not, I have questions myself. <laughs> I have a question regarding persistence IDs. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, my system written in uh, old Akka 2.5 yeah. persistence, and I have chosen my persistent IDs when I create an actor yeah. from sharding, whatever. Yeah. I control it yeah. um, explicitly as a string, and now I have seen that I have some persistence, um, some type was for the persistent keys, right? Yeah, persistence uh, ID is the yeah, type. And, yeah, and now Akka takes care about creating my persistence ID. Yeah. Can I plug in my function to compute it? Yeah, well, to compute, you compute it each time. I, I, well, I, I mean that I really, after migrating to Akka persistence yeah. type, I need this persistence IDs to match. Yeah, so, uh, so this API, is what we recommend. But if you can compute that yourself, and you, instead of using the persistence ID with that namespace plus ID, you can do persistence ID dot of unique ID, and it accepts only a string. So you don't need to have the namespace. So you can uh, work around. But the, I don't know how you are generated, but what happens here is, let's say that account ABC, the real ID in the journal will be account pipe ABC. So there is a, you can change the separator if you want. So I don't know, if you did uh, account dash the real ID, you can change it. So you don't need to have a function anymore. You just go persistent ID, that's the name space, that's the ID, and that's the separator. So it will cover. Otherwise, you can use the, the method of unique ID and do your calculation and pass that. But I think you don't need that anymore uh, unless you are really doing crazy stuff in calculating the ID. But otherwise, I think it's, uh, you're fine. Thank you. Any more questions? I will not give a minute. <laughs> okay. what, what happens when a node goes down and that doesn't respond and he has a memory that was there? Mm -hmm. um, it happened once and the idea is was just either add a node or making the, uh, the sharing recompute everything. Yeah. Yeah. So. So the, the, uh, I don't know if I, I understood your question, but I don't know if, uh, if you're asking uh, about uh, what happens if a message arrives for a node that failed, or if I'm not able to talk with that node, and, uh, or when I have a split. But in any case, I think the, uh, the answer for that is, so there is one situation. Let's say I have three nodes. And for some reason, I cannot reach one node. It's there, but I cannot reach. I receive a message that I know that I have to forward to him. At that point, nothing going to happen. I will not instance say that instance here because I cannot, I, it will just fail. I will try to send to him, but I'm not, it's not reachable. So as, as long as this situation is not solved, that message not being delivered. And you're safe. You're not the 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 that you know. Do not say, oh, uh, it's gone. I will bring it in memory because it can be the wrong decision. It will never do that. No? Now, there is another thing to solve that. You need to have a mechanism that tell 
yourself that, well, that node is gone or that node is unreachable, so you need to take a decision now. So that is the split brain resolver. So it's a, a, a commercial extension, but the API is open. So if you, you there is a description what, 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 how to use it, how to implement your, not how to implement, but what, what you have to take in consideration and what kind of problems it's solving. So you can implement your own. There are a few, out, uh, a few implementations out there, but Blightband offers a commercial version of that. And what, does, what a split brain resolver must do is, I see that this node, I'm not reaching that node, so there is some time span in which that part that, uh, for instance, there is a strategy called keep majority. So if you are three, and I can see at some point we were three, but now I can only see two nodes, me and another, means that we are in the majority, and after some time out, we're going to decide that this other one is gone, and we're going to bring those entities in memory to deliver the message. While the other one, it knows, oh, I was, we were in a, tr in a group of three, and now I'm alone. So I'm in the minority, so I have to shut down. So that's what happens. That's kind of, 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 uh, of uh, and that happens pretty quickly. And actually, in, in, in Kubernetes, as soon as it sees that there is a problem, it just shut down a node, and, and, and the others will take over. No? So this, this management is also done by, by ACA. Does it answer your question? You had a question, sir? Yeah. Uh, so, in a CQRS application, uh, is there a good pattern to build uh, views in distributed CQRS application? Yeah. I suppose that this is the last thing which you yeah. posted, but... Yeah. yeah, so I will tell you how Lagon, Lagon does that. So, we, we add the tags, so we can use Akka Persistence Query and say, okay, I want all events marked as account. But when you do that, I will take all the events from all possible accounts. So if I have 10 nodes, 1 million accounts adding events, when I do a query, I will be only consuming, I will have one consumer of, from the 1 million accounts in my cluster. No? Of course, that's a bottleneck, because you have one consumer consuming everything. How Lagon solves that is that we, we partition, we virtually partition the journal. So for each tag, we take the persistence ID model 10, let's say, S we get a number that we append to the tag. So instead of having account as a tag, I have account zero, account one, account two, account up to nine, if I'm using shard number 10. The result of that is that I have, a, I have one big journal, but the events, they are categorized, li uh, categorized different. Each of them have different tags. And I have a few of them with account zero, on, uh, another subset with account one and so on. And when you do that in Lagon, Lagon say, okay, I, I, I have tags for account going from zero to nine, and I will create 10 consumers, and I will distribute over the cluster. And each of them will consume one of those tags. So when you do that, you have distributed uh, projections. And that's what uh, is available now in Lagon. You can use that API even if you are not using Lagon, but the ideal situation is to have that abstraction uh, pull it out of Lagon and available to any ACA user, play user, and it's on our roadmap. Because uh, one, one other thing related to that is that if you, if you have one consumer and you deploy two applications, two nodes, now you have one consumer consume the same events and you don't want that. And then what people do is they put the consumer in a cluster single tone, but you still have now only one consumer consuming the whole event log. And that's not efficient. That's why we have this f feature in, in Lagon to, to, to create distributed uh, views. Yeah. So, so I, I was thinking about the, uh, creating a consumer charging group. Yeah, can you repeat? Then, then we got, uh, I. Yeah, so I was thinking that we can tie the consumer to the sharding, then have a. Uh, one consumer per sharding group. Is it possible to yeah. achieve? Yeah, the, the thing is that we need to, to be able to read the journal differently. So we need to have the tags sharded. 
and, and, and that number not necessarily is the same number of your shards on the right side. You can have different uh, requirements for performance. So you have the shard numbers on the right side, and then the read side, you may want to consume it in a different way. So that's why they are not coupled. But in any case, you need to have uh, the tags with that information, so you can query differently. Thank you.